Randy Alcorn has a great way of summing up the principles of verses 19 and 20 in Matthew 6. He says this, Imagine you're living at the end of the Civil War. You're living in the South, but you're a Northerner. You plan to move home as soon as the war is over. And while in the South, you've accumulated a lot of Confederate currency. Now suppose you know for a fact that the North is going to win the war and the end is imminent. What will you do with your Confederate money? If you're smart, there's only one answer. You should immediately cash in your Confederate currency for U.S. currency, the only money that will have value once the war is over. Keep only enough Confederate currency to meet your short-term needs. As a Christian, you have inside knowledge of an eventual worldwide upheaval caused by Christ's return. This is the ultimate insider trading tip. Earth's currency will become worthless when Christ returns, or when you die, whichever comes first. I think that's a great illustration. We've been studying through the Sermon on the Mount, and last week we began a section on what righteousness looks like in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ when it comes to dealing with earthly treasures. And Jesus begins that section by alerting us to the fact that everything you have is about to become worthless. 100% of your assets that are not converted into eternal currency will be lost. That, that's, that was the first reason that he gave us why we should not have anything at all in our earthly treasury. Second reason is in verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, that makes it an especially serious issue because being a Christian is like being married. Your heart belongs to Christ alone. It belongs in heaven alone, and if giving your heart to anything else in this world is adultery, according to James 4, and so it's a very serious matter if your heart is going the wrong way towards the world. So that's the second reason why we shouldn't have anything in our earthly treasury. Now in verses 22 and 23, Jesus is going to give us a third reason not to have our treasure on earth. third reason is this. You should not allow money or anything else in this world to become a treasure in your heart because of the disaster of a dark lamp. Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Now, if you're like me, you read that and say, what? What in the world kind of random, out of the blue statement is this? I thought we were talking about money and possessions, and, and, and what does this have to do with that? Or is Jesus just abruptly changing the subject and moving on to a new topic? I don't think Jesus is moving on to a new topic here because the next verse goes right back to money and possessions, and Jesus keeps talking about money and possessions all the way through the end of the chapter. So he's still talking about that. So what do verses 22 and 23 mean? Well, I'm not going to take you on the trail of all the different interpretations that are out there. I don't. Let's just let's just start where, with some basics and kind of an overview, so we don't lose the forest for the trees when we dig into the details. I want to start by this. I would venture to say that the main point of this section is the first statement. The eyes are the lamp of the body. That's key. That's the first thing he says, and the whole rest of it just expands on what that means. So the main point that Jesus wants us to get from this section is that the eyes are the lamp of the body. And so the goal is to have the kind of eyes that will result in the whole body being full of light. Whatever Jesus means by that, by the body being full of light, we can see that that's a good thing, right? And your whole body being full of darkness, that's a bad thing. And so, so, and the thing that makes a difference between the two is your eyes. So what does it mean to have your whole body full of light? The outcome of the right kind of eyes is a body full of light. Outcome of a wrong kind of eyes, body full of darkness. What does that mean, full of light, full of darkness? And, and why, why the body? I think when he refers to the body here, 
He means it the same way he meant it last time he talked about it in chapter 5, verse 29, where he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. So there, uh, the body is that which is thrown into hell. So it refers not just to your physical part of you, but your whole being, your whole self is what's thrown into hell. So I, I don't see any reason to assume anything different here. I think he means it the same way. What will be filled with light or filled with darkness is your whole self, your whole being. So now what is the light and the darkness? The simplest answer to that question is the light represents perception, the ability to see. Very often in the Bible, having light in your eyes means you can see, or having your eyes go dark or dim means blindness, you can't see. Psalm 69, 23, may their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. Or uh, Ephesians 1, 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you. So, so light in the eyes means you can see, darkness in the eyes means you can't see. The inability to perceive and understand as opposed to the ability to see and understand. However, Jesus' point here, he doesn't focus just on the eyes having light, but rather the body or the whole self having light or being filled with light by means of the eyes. So what does it mean for your whole self to be filled with light or darkness? Uh, most of the time, if you, and I spent a lot of time the past couple weeks studying, what does scripture say about light in your life? And most of the time, that's a metaphor to refer to spiritual life from God. Psalm 13, 3. Look on me and answer, O Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. So light uh, is opposed to death. It's the opposite of death. Um, so living is the opposite of dying. Life in Scripture is its a lot more than just having a pulse. It's not just talking about not being completely dead. The word life refers to all the various components of life. Health, uh, strength, fullness, uh, energy, hope, and especially joy. All of those things, those are the components of life. Those are the things that are ebbing away when somebody is in the process of dying. And so if you're full of life, then you have a lot of those things. Uh, for example, strength. Uh, Psalm 38, 7, There is no health in my body. I'm feeble and utterly crushed. I groan in anguish of heart. My strength fails me, and the light has gone out from my eyes. So light there represents all the various components of life in that text, especially strength. Um, so loss of strength is like the loss of light out of your eyes. Uh, another main component of life, one of the most important ones, as I mentioned, is joy. And so very often light is used as a synonym for joy. In fact, in Esther 8.14, it says, For the Jews, it was a time of happiness, joy, gladness, and honor. And that first word, happiness, it's actually the word light. It's light. But they translated happiness because obviously that's what it means here with joy and gladness and honor. So light can be a synonym for, for joy, 15, uh, Proverbs 15, 30, the light of the eyes rejoices the heart. And so darkness then goes along with sorrow. The dying process, part of, part of the dying process is your joy ebbs away, and, which is like going into darkness. Job 16, 16, my faith is, face is red with weeping and darkness covers my eyes. Job 17, 7, my eyes have grown dim with grief. My whole frame is but a shadow. Psalm 88, 9, my eyes are faint with grief. So, so light coming out of the eyes represents joy ebbing away. Per perception, uh, it begins with perception. Light coming into the eyes begins with perception, the ability to see things. And when you see things as they really are, that results in life, spiritual life from God. And when you have fullness of life in you, the result of that is righteousness. And so very often you see light used to represent righteousness. Um, Matthew 6, 5, 16, that's how Jesus used it earlier in the sermon. Let your light shine before men so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So light there is good deeds, righteousness. So sometimes light points to perception. Sometimes it points to spiritual life from God and other times to righteousness. And all of that makes sense because all three of those are so connected. They, they, they go together. 
They're so intertwined, you can't possibly separate them. When you see things as they really are, that increases your spiritual health and, and that increases your righteousness. It's impossible to look at it from the other direction. It's impossible to have righteousness without having spiritual health and strength and joy. And, it's, and the only way to have spiritual health and strength and joy is to be able to see things as they really are, to have perception. And here's why. God's commands for us... The things that he wants us to do are essentially have to do with our desires, right? He wants you to love what's good and then to do what you love. He wants us to desire good things. That's what righteousness is all about. Being able to love that which is truly beautiful and excellent. But if you can't see that that which is truly beautiful is beautiful, if it doesn't look beautiful to you, if it doesn't seem excellent to you, if it doesn't seem satisfying to you, then you're never going to be able to desire it. God doesn't just call you to pray or read your Bible or worship or fellowship with Him or to give generously or to carry out the work of the ministry and love the saints and all that. He requires you to not just do all that. He requires you to want all of that, to desire all of that. And you're never going to desire those things until you can see them as wonderful, as desirable. You have to be able to see things as they really are. So the inability to see things as they really are makes righteousness ultimately impossible. And it destroys your spiritual life and health. When you can't see things as they really are, for one, you have a whole lot less strength, for one thing, right? Instead of being strong so that you can handle big-time suffering uh, without any problem, you become weak so you can hardly handle any suffering because you can't see the truth uh, about, from God about the meaning of your suffering. You can't see the value of your suffering. You can't see the promises that go along with your suffering. And so you can't uh, appreciate what's going on. You can't see what's on the other side of that suffering and all that. So instead of functioning in a powerful and effective way in your life, you and your calling, you kind of limp along with an ineffective and unproductive pattern of failure after failure because you can't see the importance of the work or the rewards connected with it. You can't see the priorities of God. So you end up spinning your wheels and majoring on the minors and unimportant things and, and neglecting the really important things. And you won't be able to, when you can't perceive right, your eyes are dim, you can't see uh, what you need to see for all of these things to be in place. And it'll drain you of strength and joy and health and hope and all the other components of life. As a result, your righteousness will diminish. And that's why, that's what Jesus means when he talks about your whole self will be full of darkness. You can't see things as they really are. Next thing you know, you got less spiritual life and you get less righteousness and the whole thing just goes black. But being full of light means having, having a great measure of spiritual perception. You can see things as they really are. That makes you want the right things. You have a lot of spiritual life and health and strength and joy. And as a result, you have a lot of righteousness. And that's your whole life being full of light. So you see that? That's what the outcome, that's the good and the bad outcome of having the right kind of eyes. And all of it depends on your eyes, whether your eyes are good or bad. Now, that brings us to the next question. What are the eyes? What is, what is this eyes? Um, what, what is good and bad eyes? Good and bad, probably, those words probably aren't the best English words to translate the Greek words here. The most literal translation would be sincere eyes and evil eyes. Now, we know what evil eyes are. That's easy because that's a very common Jewish figure of speech that refers to greed or envy. Uh, we see that in the Old Testament, we see it in the New Testament, we see it in extra biblical literature again and again. The, the, the evil eye just means greed, greedy man. Uh, when you look at people, when you look at things with covetous or greedy or envious eyes, uh, that's the evil eye. So, in a word, selfishness. Selfishness. That's the evil eye. Um, on the other hand, in Proverbs 22.9, the phrase good eye is translated generous. The opposite of evil eye is a good eye, and that's generous. And, and, and sometimes it's not good eye. It's, it's, you can use different words. For example, there's one place where it says a beautiful eye, outside of Scripture, it says a beautiful eye uh, is described as a generous, per, generous person. So it's somewhat of an elastic figure of speech. Evil eye means greed, covetousness, 
good or beautiful eye, some kind of positive word with the word eye refers to generosity. And so we can see how this fits into the context of what Jesus is talking about in this section. It's not an obtuse thing. It's talking about generosity as opposed to greed. But then we have the question, why does Jesus say sincere? Instead of, if your eyes are good, that's what we'd expect for generosity, good eyes. But instead he says sincere eyes. It's the only place anywhere in any Greek literature that we see this sincere eyes figure. What does that mean? The Greek word is oplus, and it, 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 here's what the dictionary, if you look up in the Greek dictionary, this is the most basic definition. This is right at the beginning, very first thing you read in the dictionary. The word oplus means being motivated by singleness of purpose, so as to be open and above board, single, without guile, sincere, straightforward, i.e., without a hidden agenda. That is the most straightforward way to translate this word. Sincerity. It refers to sincerity. You say, well, then why don't the translators say sincere eye instead of good eye? The reason they, alt they opt for alternate translations uh, of this word is because it seems to most like the word sincere just doesn't fit the context. And that's, that's what you do sometimes when you're translating, and, and the, the typical, most common de definition of a word doesn't fit the context, then you opt for maybe a less common use of that word if it does fit the context, and so that's what they do. Um, but is that really necessary here? I would suggest that the normal common definition of this word actually makes excellent sense in the context, and we don't need to go to an alternative if you just back up and consider the context of the whole chapter. Let me just read you the, the straightforward reading of this text. This is what it really, I believe, says. It says, if the eye, your way of looking at earthly treasure, is above board, sincere, straightforward, without a hidden agenda, then your whole body will be full of light. Now, is there anything in the context of Matthew 6 that has to do with having a sincere, honest, above-board motive without selfish, hidden agendas? Is that in the context? Is that in chapter 6? Yes! That's what the whole chapter's about. The whole chapter, since starting in verse 1, has been over and over. Jesus says, don't be like the hypocrites who have selfish motives for everything they're doing. He's been preaching against selfish, mixed motives the whole chapter. And now, when he turns to speak about treasure on earth, it shouldn't come as any surprise to anybody that he would say, if you look at money and possessions and earthly treasures with selfish, mixed motives, it's going to have a bad result, darkness. And if you look at possessions and money with pure, unmixed, unselfish motives, it's going to have a good result, light in your life. So there's no reason, I don't, I don't think, to look for any alternative translation here. We should just go with the normal meaning, sincere. Sincere. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are sincere, without a selfish mixed motive, your whole body will be full of light. And there's one other factor that just kind of adds support to this interpretation, and that is there's another form of this Greek word that actually is used several times in the New Testament, uh, a, a, a derivative of aplus. It's a, another form of that word. And about half of the time, that word means generous, and the other half of the time, that word means sincere. And so the idea of sincerity and generosity uh, seem to be just conjoined and mixed together within this word. This one word has both ideas in it. Um, the truly generous man is sincere in the sense that he doesn't have a mixed motive. His, his motives are singular and not dual, is the idea. He's, he's not selfish. So what Jesus is doing here is showing us the connection between the immediate context that he's talking about treasures, and the broader context of the chapter, which is about uh, 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 having unmixed, unselfish motives. And he's showing us how those two things fit together. He's teaching us that generosity is a matter of the eyes, the way you look at things. Generosity is a matter of the way that you look at things. It's not just a matter of what you do. It's a mistake to think of generosity simply as a matter of how much you give of your actions. 
Most people think if you give a lot, you're generous. If you don't give a lot, you're not generous. That's not always the case. Sometimes stingy people give a lot. The Pharisees gave 10% of everything they had, everything they received, all the way down to their little herbs and spices, 10% of everything. They, but they weren't generous. There are plenty of selfish motivations that can come and push a stingy person to give. You know, to get glory for himself or whatever, but his heart is still just as stingy as ever. That's why in the book of Proverbs warns us, don't even, don't even accept gifts from people like that, from a stingy person. Uh, Proverbs 23, 6, don't eat the food of a stingy man. Literally, it says, do not eat the food of an evil eye, a stingy man. Do not crave his delicacies, for he's the t kind of man who's always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the little that you have eaten, and you will have wasted your compliments. The guy seems generous enough. He's saying, eat, drink, you know, have your, go, you know, knock yourself out, have as much as you want. Uh, he's giving you food, he's giving to you, but even though he's doing that, he's stingy because of what's in his heart. He's sort of begrudging you the, the, the food, and so, so wisdom says, look, you're dealing with people like that, don't even, don't even, Eat. Don't, don't accept gifts from people like that, because you eat the meal, and the next thing you know, the guy thinks you owe him, you know, your, your soul practically. He gave you this, he thinks he gave you this huge gift, and it's just going to cause problems. Don't even accept gifts. In their selfishness and stinginess, they're going to think of you as being in their debt. So, so the whole point of all that is it's possible to give a lot and still be a stingy person. Stinginess Selfishness, generosity, those are matters not just of your actions, but of your eyes, the way you look at things. It's a matter of what's in your heart, the way you look at things and people. That's why Jesus here speaks about generous eyes rather than talking about just giving. He doesn't use the word giving. He doesn't mention giving here. He's always concerned about the heart, not just external actions. So instead of talking about giving, he talks about a generous eye. You could routinely give away 70% of your income and still do it with a stingy eye, and the only reward you would get for all of that would just be a whole lot of darkness in your life. This is why God loves a cheerful giver, right? A cheerful giver is the only kind of giving that really counts as actual giving. Grudging giving, reluctant giving, giving that feels to you like a loss isn't generosity. You know, you write a big check and put it in the offering box and it feels like a loss to you. You give to someone in need, it feels like a loss to you. That's not generosity. If it isn't driven by joy, then it's coming from a selfish heart uh, rather than a generous heart. It's coming from an evil eye instead of a sincere eye and it's worthless. It's worse than worthless. And that's bad news for stingy, selfish givers. But it's great news for... People who have generous eyes but can't give for whatever reason. There are some of you who would love to give more, or you just don't have more to give. But even with the little you have, you do give a lot. You're generous with that. You wish you could give more. You know, I think here of wives who, whose husbands won't let them give. You know, sometimes you've got a Christian wife, a non-Christian husband. She wants to give. He won't let her give anything to the, help the poor or give to the church or anything. And, but it's in her heart to do it. She wishes she could do it. And... and if she could, she would do it in a heartbeat, and with whatever little resources she does control, you know, her time and her energy and her talents and, you know, whatever, she, she is generous with those things. Or maybe like the little pocket change that she does carry around, she can, she, she'll give up a trip to Starbucks or something so that she can give. She, she, she has it in her heart to give, and, and um, that woman's life, Jesus says, will be full of light. Even though she's not giving hardly anything, it'll be full of light because... He, she has generous eyes. So, possible, it's possible to be the biggest giver in the church and have your life full of darkness because of your stinginess. It's possible to give $2 a week and have your life, life full of light because of your generosity. Now, why the connection? This is the, here's the question that came up in my mind these last two weeks as I was studying this. Why... The connection between generosity and light in your life. 
the, the reward, the benefit of generosity is, is this light. Why? What's, what's the connection between generous eyes and the ability to have perception and see things as they really are? How, or put it negatively, why does greed in your heart prevent you from being able to see properly? How does it cloud your vision? The answer to that question is very, very important for living the Christian life. Most of us imagine that our perception, our ability to understand things and perceive reality is more than anything else a function of the mind. We gather the facts, we weigh them rationally, and we just trust our minds to be able to come up with the right conclusion. That's really not how it works. That's an oversimplification. There's something way down deep inside you, deeper than your mind, that gets a hold of the facts before they get to your mind and colors those facts one way or the other so that when your, your mind never just gets the plain facts. What your mind gets are dis doctored facts that are colored in such a way as to point to one conclusion or another. And that thing, way down deep inside you, coloring the facts, this grid through which all facts have to pass before they get to your brain, is what Jesus calls your eyes. That's what he's talking about when he says eyes here. It's, it's a part of your heart where your motives and cravings and, and biases and attitudes live. It's a thing that's deep down inside you that decides, and, and when that thing, that deep down inside you decides that, that option A is out of the question, then when you think it through, no matter what you think, all your conclusions are going to point to option B. When you're, even when you're trying to make an honest, unbiased appraisal of the facts, it's just going to clearly point to option B. And I don't think it's possible to override that. I've seen it in my own life. I have tried to interpret a passage of Scripture, tried my absolute hardest to just be completely unbiased and only go by the facts of the text without any prejudice one way or the other, and, and, and the facts pointed me to a certain interpretation, and then years later when my attitudes toward certain things changed, I studied that text again, and I realized that interpretation was wrong, it was the other way, and, and, and the facts didn't really point where I thought they were pointing, but it was because of certain attitudes and values in me that colored the facts before they reached my brain that made me think that they were pointing that way. Now, if you're a reasonable, rational kind of person and you highly value rational thinking and, then, and you believe what I'm saying right now, then this should terrify you, right? I mean, this is scary. Scary thing to think about. The idea that you can't count on your mind to arrive at a conclusion that's completely objective, that is scary. It's scary because you think, if I can't count on my intellect, then how am I going to ever know if my interpretations of the Bible and my understanding of things are of truth is correct or not? How can I know? And the answer is this. The only way to see to it that... Now, actually, before I give that answer... I'll tell you what our culture says. The culture will say there is no answer to that. You can't be sure. That's why we have to have, this is the, the latest thing now, the, what they call the hermeneutics of humility. You just got to hold everything loosely. You can't be sure about anything because you got your biases pushing you all over the place. And nobody can be, nobody's unbiased and therefore uh, you just can't know for sure. I don't agree with that. You can know for sure. But the only way to know for sure, the only way to make sure that you're arriving at the right conclusion is to make sure that that thing deep down inside you that's coloring the facts is healthy. If that thing is healthy, it will color the facts properly and will push your mind toward right conclusions, even when your mind doesn't even have enough facts to really weigh everything perfectly. And what is that thing deep down inside you that's coloring the facts that needs to be healthy? It's, Jesus says, your eyes. Well, that's the metaphor of the eyes. It's your way of looking at people and things. 
maybe a better word would be outlook. It's your outlook. What is your outlook on life? If it's selfish, greedy outlook, then all the facts are going to tend to be colored the wrong way, and you're not going to be able to discern what's true. But if it's an honest, generous outlook, then you're going to be able to see things clearly, as they really are, and, and arrive at correct conclusions. Last week we found that your earthly treasury, this thing that's supposed to be empty, it, 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 it's made up of all the things that you treasure in your heart, you, the things that you feel like you have to have in order to be happy, but that won't exist a million years from now. That's earthly treasure. And so the goal is to empty your earthly treasury because there is nothing that you have to have, no temporal thing that you have to have in order to be happy. God is all you need. Uh, that's what we just sang about. So, so we've got to empty that earthly treasury, and it's important to empty the earthly treasury, Jesus says, for three reasons. First, earthly treasure will be lost. Second, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. It's a matter of faithfulness. And third, now this is the third reason, you're, you should empty your earthly treasury because... The more stuff you've got in your earthly treasury, the more th temporal things there are that you think you have to have in order to be happy, the more it will distort your spiritual vision. You won't be able to see things as they really are. If you think you have to have money, a certain amount of money in order to be happy, or a certain relationship, or a certain marital situation, or a certain job, then, then you're... you're perceived need for those things is going to color all the facts. And there's three different kinds of facts that it will color. Bible facts, wisdom facts, and people facts. Um, uh, let's take those one at a time. All three of those, if you have a selfish outlook, will get distorted. First, Bible facts. Anytime a, a certain passage um, starts to look to you like it's going to have implications that are going that might put your earthly treasure at risk this thing that you have to have in order to be happy this thing that's in your earthly treasury and that's at risk this passage verse I'm studying might might mean that I have to let go of that that is my heart is going to color that data as I do my exegesis and I'm going to come up with the wrong interpretation if your eyes are greedy or covetous or covetous or or envious or selfish, your eyes are going to go dark, your whole self will be full of darkness, which means when you try to understand God's Word, you won't be able to do it. You won't be able to understand it. There are people who cannot understand the Bible. They read it and they study it. They cannot make heads or tails out of it uh, in a certain area because they're treasuring something. There are people who can't understand what the Bible says about divorce because they, one of the things they treasure is, their, is the option of leaving their spouse if things get too hard. They don't want to let go of that option. That's a treasury, treasure for them. And so they, they, they read about what the Bible says about the divorce, and they say, I can't understand this. If you have anything in this world that is an earthly treasure, um, then when Scripture speaks about that thing, you're not going to be able to understand it right. And that's, that's true of Scripture, and it's true of wisdom. When you try to make wisdom decisions and discern how God is leading you in life, uh, you're, you're going to pray, God, please guide me. Show me your will. Show me what you want to do. Show me the wise path. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do here. I don't know how to handle this situation. And you'll pray and plead with God. And no matter how much you pray and how much you plead with God, you won't be able to see the wise path. You won't be able to see the right way to go. You're going to keep going the wrong way every time and keep falling down and getting lost and having problems. There are people who are begging God for direction and wisdom, and they're just as lost as they've ever been. Then they make one bad decision after another after another, and they get in all kinds of problems simply because deep down inside them, there's an attitude of the heart, there's a way of their eyes are looking at something that's selfish, more greedy rather than generous, and so their vision is clouded and they can't see wisdom. They say, God, show me your will. And God says, okay, here's my will right there. It's the path, right? It, this path, uh, that, and you look down that path and it leads to selling your home and downsizing so you can give more, and you say, that ah, can't possibly be the wise way. Okay, show me another road here. Because their eyes are looking at their house in such a way 
that it makes it impossible for them to see God's will. They say, God, show me your will. And God says, okay, here's my will, this path right here. And it, it's the path of breaking off this relationship that is leading you into sin. Or this path of quitting this job. And, and their eyes look at that relationship or they look at that job in such a way that they can't see God guiding them that way. You see that, how the outlook affects the perception? If the question before you is 2 plus 2, if, that's, if you're dealing with the equation 2 plus 2, but there's something deep down inside you that, that rejects 4 as a possible answer, then no matter how many PhDs you get in mathematics, you will not be, it will be impossible for you to solve this equation. It'll be an enormously complicated, difficult, painful, impossible question to answer 2 plus 2 if 4 is out of the picture. You see that? So, you're cut off from the truth of Scripture, and you're cut off from wisdom and guidance, and then thirdly, you're also cut off from the truth about people when it comes to relationships and dealing with people. You get fouled up there. You'll constantly misread people, misunderstand people, misconstrue their words, misinterpret their motives. Get all, you're, you're, if you have selfish eyes, if you look at people with selfish eyes, it's going to make it seem like people are showing you love. When people are showing you love and kindness, you're going to look at that and it's going to feel like cruelty. You ever had people like that? They have selfish eyes and when you try and show them kindness, they think you're being mean. People with selfish eyes, they think everybody's inconsiderate. Everybody. And they bounce from church to church to church to church. Every church they've ever been to, everybody there was unloving towards them, unfriendly towards them, inconsiderate towards them. And, and, and they just leave behind them a trail of broken relationships wherever they go because they're incapable of seeing the truth of what's really going on in these relationships because they're looking with selfish eyes. Can you see why I titled this sermon, The Disaster of a Dark Lamp? The, the dark lamp. The eyes are the lamp of the body. Your outlook, this thing deep down inside you, the way you look at stuff, the way you look at people, that's the lamp of the body. It's what lets the light in. Your whole body be full of light. That's a wonderful thing. If your whole body is full of darkness, that's a disaster. It's a disaster. That's why Jesus concludes this whole section by saying, and if the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? That is an exclamation. If the only lamp in the house just emits nothing but blackness, you've got a huge, huge darkness problem. It's, it's worse than blindness. It is more like schizophrenia. And here's what I mean by that. The function of, of eyes is to be able to perceive reality, right? The world around you. You, you walk into a dark, pitch dark room. You have no idea what's there. You're, you're oblivious to the reality. There's a reality there, but you're oblivious to it because you can't see it. Somebody flips on the light instantly. Uh, you, know, you know a thousand facts about this room. Now you're connected to reality. So seeing connects you to the real world out there. So in a sense... Light is your connection to reality. Having the lights go out cuts you off from reality. And that's what schizophrenia means. That's what insanity is. Detachment from reality. That's the schism in schizophrenia. Detachment from reality. Blind people are not schizophrenic. They're not really detached from reality because they've got some other senses. They can still perceive the world around them by their hearing and their touch and, and all that. But an insane person, it really is detached from reality. They see things and they hear things that aren't actually there. And what they think is happening isn't happening. And they're not capable of discerning what's actually happening and what's not happening. They're cut off from reality. They don't know what's true and what isn't true. And that's the situation Jesus is describing here. When, when selfishness creeps into your outlook then you've got a huge, huge darkness problem because you're not just blind, you're spiritually insane because you're cut off from 
the real world, seeing things as they really are, and, and without any remedy. There's no remedy to this. It's a horrible, horrible fate. I mean, if I asked for a show of hands right now, how many of you would prefer, uh, if you had to choose between blindness or insanity? I'm sure we'd all rather be blind than insane, cut off from reality, right? A horrible thing to be disconnected from reality. No wonder Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, 9, people who want to get rich, and fall into, they fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. That's Paul's way of saying this exact same thing. Their whole self is full of darkness. So, how do you change that thing? deep down inside you that colors the facts, your outlook. How, how do you make yourself more generous? Well, Jesus says it's by having a sincere eye. That is an eye, an outlook, that doesn't have selfish motives. It's really simple. When you look at people, when you look at things, make sure that you're looking at them with both eyes. You're looking totally at them and not partly at them and partly at yourself. That's the mixed motive. Our temptation is to use one eye to look at other people, and the other eye, we keep an eye on our own interests and our own comfort and make sure that that's guarded and, and safe and secure. You see, it's, you, you look at some earthly treasure, and you got one eye on that treasure and the other eye on yourself, and you're always asking everything you see. You're just like, how could this thing make my life more comfortable? How could this thing make my life happier? Not, how could that thing be used for the kingdom? Or, not, uh, how worthless is that thing in eternity? Or, how could that thing be used to love people? How, how are we looking at stuff? You just walk through the mall, or, or, or Home Depot, or wherever you walk, and, and you look at the stuff around you, how are your eyes looking at that stuff? Are they looking at the stuff and then back to yourself, mixed? Or are they just looking at the stuff for, as far as how that could be used for God's purposes? A selfish eye, the first thought is always, how can this thing make my life nicer? And so the next thing you know, we're living lives that are just pushing the limits on luxury and indulgence. Just pushing the limits. How nice of a vacation should we take? How much money? Can, how, how much can we afford? However much we can afford, that's how much we're going to spend. Maybe more than that. However much money is available, that's what we're going to spend on ourselves. How nice a house can we buy? Well, what's the maximum amount they're going to let us borrow? That's how nice a house we're going to buy. What kind of refrigerator should I get? What model has all of the features that I want? If I can afford it, that's the one we're getting. And, and as I said, sometimes even if we don't have the money, that doesn't stop us. They advertise 0% financing, and so we buy things we don't even have the money for, assuming that we're going to have extra money in the future. We, we weren't able to set aside extra money up to now, but somehow everything's going to be different in the future. We'll have all kinds of extra money we'll be able to put towards these payments. And so we go into debt for extra luxury. So people are borrowing money for depreciating items, you know, like a car. And we live in a culture where the mere fact that you don't have enough money for something does, is no hindrance at all to purchasing it. And we turn around now and then say, oh, I'm sorry, God, I can't, I can't help that person. I can't support that missionary. I can't do all this stuff because every month I need everything I can get just to make all the payments on all the stuff I borrowed to obtain. A generous eye is going to want to live on less than 100% of your income so that you can give. A greedy eye will live on, use up 100% of your income on yourself and maybe even more than 100%. And I'm not, I'm not saying that it's it, it always because of greed that people get into debt. There's other reasons why people get into debt. But I'm just saying often that's the case. Very often, it's because our eyes look at things with a view towards maximizing personal comfort that we get into debt. And that's a completely, it just totally short circuits generosity when you do that because you're looking at things the wrong way. Your outlook is selfish. And, and same thing with people. You're going to look at people, you see someone in need, you see someone who, who needs something that you have, 
And instead of just focusing on focusing both your eyes on their need, you got one eye on their need, and you got one eye busy analyzing your own comfort and how you can safeguard that and make sure that this isn't too much of a problem, you know, as far as sacrificing comfort. And the price you pay for that little effort to preserve your comfort is blackness in your life, darkness, insanity, inability to perceive reality. But if you can focus both your eyes on the needy person and let God worry about your comfort, your life will fill up with light. Generous people are generous because they're able to focus both eyes on the needs of people. They, they, they just have a, an acute awareness of need. They just see a needy person, and that's all they see is the needy person. They're not looking at their own self. And, 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 and when they see, they look at that person, they, they just think about it. They consider what is it like to be in that person's shoes and to, to have that need. And imagine, they imagine how hard that person's situation feels, and, and before long their compassion is just welling up and driving them to find a way to give. Like I said in my prayer this morning, I mean, it seems like it's commonplace in the New Testament for people to sell their possessions in order to be able to give. When's the last time you sold something so that you could give more? And I'm talking about needy people here, and I realize Jesus doesn't specify the needy here, uh, but I think we can glean from the rest of Jesus' teaching that that's, that's the emphasis. There's a huge emphasis in Jesus' teaching on giving to the needy, giving to the poor. That's emphasized. It's especially good when you're dealing with motives because the poor, are, they can't repay you, and so you don't have to worry about maybe having a mixed motive. Luke 14, 12, then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or relatives or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back so that you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resur resurrection of the righteous. So that's one way to kind of keep your motives in check um, uh, is to give to the poor. And also just compassion. God has special compassion on the poor. And so we need to always be giving to the poor. I mean, that is just emphasized so often. You remember when they sent Paul out and they basically told him, uh, well, you're the, you know, Christ called you, so just do whatever you want. There's only one thing we require of you, Paul. Make sure that you take care of the poor. And you see that emphasis. Maybe I'll talk some more about this next week. But this emphasis on giving to the poor again and again and again is so important in Scripture that we give to the poor and the needy. And it's hard in our culture because we don't have a lot of poverty like their kind of poverty. I mean, we have poverty where people are, the poor people have flat screen TVs and, you know, two cars and all kinds of luxuries. Um, but there are needy people around us. And there are poor people elsewhere that we can help. And so last week in the Agape 101 class, I was teaching the class, and somebody asked about designated giving. And I told them that in general, we discourage designated giving in Agape. Uh, we don't really think that's God's way because um, the, re the people who have the responsibility in the church to decide how the offerings are spent is the leadership of the church. And so when you designate your giving, you're bypassing the leadership of the church, and you're making the call yourself, and we don't, we don't believe that's the biblical model for leadership in the church, and so we discourage people from designated giving. You're welcome to make any suggestion you want. If you, if you say, you know, I think we need, uh, 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 you know, we need a certain item. In fact, this thing I'm standing on here, somebody uh, found out that my back was getting sore when I was preaching, and so they said, uh, I think we should get Daryl a... a what do you call this? A chef's mat to stand in. It's a squishy mat, I think. And so I'm up here in, in luxury right now uh, in self-indulgence. But anyway, uh, they, and they, they, does, they donated some money. They said, here's enough money to buy one of those things, and I think we should do that. And that was a suggestion. It wasn't a mandate, uh, but the, the leadership agreed and went ahead and got me this thing. So appreciate that, by the way. But anyway, uh, the, the point of that is, if you make a suggestion, you can do that. You can make a suggestion, but we don't do designated giving. With two exceptions. There's two exceptions to this. There are two areas where we actually encourage designated giving, and that is giving to the poor and giving to missions. And, the, and the, giving to the poor is benevolence. And this is a, uh, it's kind of fortuitous that we would talk about this today because it's, this is the first Sunday of the month, our, our benevolence day, when we have our benevolence offering. Benevolence just means Money that you give that goes directly to people in need. Um, we urge you to go ahead and give your regular offering check. That goes into the general fund. That pays the bills. 
and then write another check to the benevolence fund that goes to help the needy. Um, that, the reason we have it set up that way with two separate funds so that, is so that when you give, you can know for sure that that particular gift will go to help someone in need. You got a certain portion of your budget for helping the poor, helping the needy, and you can be, have 100% certainty that that check, it won't go to pay the, the, the utility bill, it's not going to go and pay for you know, food for a potluck or anything like that, it's going to the needy. And we set that up so that you can give to the needy through the church. Now, you don't have to give through the church. You can give directly to needy people if you want. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that at all. I personally like to do it through the church because most of the needy people I run into are so needy I don't have enough to really help them. My little bit that I would give wouldn't really help them that much. But if we all, you know, if we all set aside like 2 or 3% of our income, give that to our, the benevolence fund, then there's enough money in the benevolence that when somebody does have a need, we're able to really help them with significant amounts. The other one is missions, and, and uh, I might talk about that some more next time, um, but it's, it, it's similar. It, the, the missions, um, the money we give to missions, a lot of that goes to help the really, really poor people in India so that we're giving to the needy. Our giving should rise from a heart that shares the priorities of the heart of God. And, and that, that strikes right at the heart of the gospel itself. Jesus emptied himself of his riches in Philippians 2 and calls us to follow that example. 1 John 3.17, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother in need and has no pity on him, how can the love of God be in him? Greed is a mark of unbelief. But when you have both eyes on the person in need, without regard for your own preserving your own comfort, the lights go on, and your whole life floods with light. You start to see things as they really are, and your perceptions are accurate, and your desire, you start to desire good things because you can see them as beautiful, and that increases your righteousness, it increases your health, your spiritual life, your strength, your energy, your hope, your joy, and therefore your righteousness, and on top of all that, stockpiles eternal reward and riches in heaven.